everyone and welcome and thank you for joining us today for the Kidney Pancreas Community of Practices webinar. Today's webinar, Implications of ESRD Treatment Choice Payment Model for Kidney Transplant Centers, will be presented by Dr. Benjamin Hippen. Our moderators for today, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Velez, will introduce our presenter, Dr. Hippen, in just one moment. But before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. In a moment, I will be adding a poll to your screen. We use this poll to understand how many people are viewing with us today. Please take a moment and answer this question while we finish with the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available in the, at the Kidney Pancreas Community of Practice Hub later this week. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the Journal Club, we encourage you to participate by using the question section in the Zoom webinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. Questions submitted via the chat section may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions we don't have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the webinar. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's Journal Club, you will see a link to a short survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator to begin our presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon to uh, everyone. My name is uh, Ruben Velez. I'm from Dallas Nephrology Associates. And it's a pleasure to be one of the moderators with Dr. Matthew Cooper. Um, with an important topic that, as, as many of you know, uh, is something that just started this month, in fact, January of 2021. Back in July of 2019, uh, there was an executive order that essentially created Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. And from there came new payment models that our speaker uh, will present at least one of them, uh, the one that is active uh, at this point. With that said, um, I would uh, ask uh, um, Dr. Matthew Cooper to present our speaker. Dr. Cooper is president-elect of, of UNOS, director of kidney pancreas transplantation at uh, Georgetown Transplant Institute. Uh, Dr. Cooper. Ruben, thank you. Uh, and. Again, on behalf of the uh, AST KP Community Practice, I want to welcome everybody to our, our webinar this afternoon. Again, uh, I hope that you will find this as intriguing as both uh, Dr. Velez and I have, having spoken to our speaker on probably several occasions about this topic. Dr. Ben Hippen is a, a colleague and a true friend of mine. He's a general and transplant nephrologist with Metrolina Nephrology Associates. That's a private practice in Charlotte, North Carolina. We've asked him, and not surprising, he's worn a number of hats over the years, including spending time on the uh, OPTN UNOS Ethics Committee, as well as the Membership Professional Standards Committee. Uh, he's been on also their board of directors, and he's also been on the medical review board of the ESRD Network 6. Ben's been a, a previous associate editor for the AJT. He's authored more than 50 articles and book chapters uh, on topics of ethics and public policy, and so this is certainly right in his wheelhouse. His recent area of focus, uh, importantly, is identifying ways of dismantling the silos between practices, nephrology practices, dialysis providers, and transplant centers. And, and certainly, as Ruben mentioned, uh, as was one of the purposes of the American Advancing American Kidney Health to do just that. And ben currently serves on the board of directors for Interwell Health, which is a nephrology-focused population health management company and he as well as a member of our AST Kidney Pancreas Public Policy Committee. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ben Hippen, who's gonna to talk to about us uh, implications of the ESRD treatment choice payment model for kidney transplant centers. So welcome, Ben. Thank you, and uh, thanks, Dr. Cooper, for that introduction, as well as Dr. Velez. Uh, and I'll jump right in. So our topic today is uh, implications of the ESRD treatment choice model, or ETC payment model for kidney transplant centers. Uh, my email is at the bottom of uh, this presentation and will also be at the end. I'm also happy to take your questions offline. This is a complicated topic. 
uh, and I am happy to answer specific questions if we don't get to all of them today. Uh, need to uh, review some uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, I am a consultant to uh, the Global Medical Office of Fresenius Medical Care on Transplant Related Matters. Uh, as uh, Dr. Cooper mentioned, I am a member of the Board of Directors of Interwell Health. Uh, I am also uh, a medical director for an in-center hemodialysis and home therapies uh, clinic uh, affiliated with uh, Fresenius Kidney Care. Uh, the views and opinions offered in this presentation today are mine, uh, not Fresenius and not Metroline Nephrology. Uh, all errors and omissions are my own. I will not be discussing any off-label uh, use of pharmaceuticals or medical products. Uh, and I did uh, make use of some slides from a colleague of mine at Fresenius, uh, Dr. Terry Ketcherson. So uh, to revisit what Dr. Velez uh, mentioned at the top of the talk, uh, the stated goals of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative when it was uh, rolled out in July of 2019 were three. Uh, the first was to reduce the number of Americans developing ESRD uh, by 25% by the year 2030. The second was to uh, double the number of organs available for transplant by 2030 and that 80% uh, of new incident ESRD patients in 2025 would either start with a home therapy, peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis, uh, or start uh, uh, their renal replacement uh, with a functioning transplant. Um, there are several uh, payment models uh, under the rubric of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today only about the so-called mandatory model, uh, the ESRD treatment choices or ETC model. Uh, there are a number of voluntary payment models that Dr. Velez alluded to. Um, a, a talk on the voluntary models would easily consume another hour, um, and I would be happy if we have time to uh, address some questions with regard to the voluntary models, but that will not be the focus of my talk today. So um, here is the who, when, and how of the ETC model. Um, who is going to be in the model? Um, this is ostensibly a random selection uh, of uh, geographies stratified by region of general nephrologists and dialysis facilities, uh, comprising 30% uh, of what are called HRRs or hospital referral reasons uh, that, are, that have been selected by CMS uh, to participate in the ESRD treatment choices model. Transplant centers per se are not included in the ETC model and individual nephrologists' performance in the ETC model, according to metrics I will describe in subsequent slides, are actually grouped by practice or more specifically by a practice TIN number. The model started in January 1st of this year uh, and it will extend uh, another six and a half years out to June of 2027. And the way the ETC model works is it imposes financial bonuses and penalties tied to a so-called modality performance score which is designed to increase both the prevalence of uh, home dialysis modalities, increase wait listing for kidney transplantation and increase living donor kidney transplantation. This is a map of hospital referral regions in the United States. And the next map shows the HRRs that have been selected for enrollment in the ETC model. Um, I would just parenthetically note that uh, it, those of you on the phone call who are familiar with the CMMI pilot project uh, ESCOs, the ESRD Seamless Care Organizations, that uh, a number of uh, HRRs that were selected for ETC, uh, uh, ETC participation uh, were also uh, members of the ESRD Seamless Care Organizations or ESCOs. Uh, this shows a, a market overlap. Uh, on the left are the ETC selected hospital referral regions. And on the right uh, are participants in the uh, 33 ESRD seamless care organizations. And as you can see, there's a fair amount of overlap there. So uh, the ETC, as I mentioned, involves both the general nephrologist and the dialysis provider. Uh, as regards the nephrologist, uh, patients that are attributed to the nephrologist and by extension to the nephrology practice are patients whose primary insurance is tr traditional Medicare for their uh, ESRD uh, coverage, as well as patients who have Medicare as a secondary payer. So uh, this is not just patients with traditional Medicare. Uh, this would also include patients whose primary uh, insurance is commercial insurance who has Medicare as a secondary. 
excluded uh, from attribution are uh, patients who have a Medicare Advantage plan, who purchase a Medicare Advantage plan, or whose primary insurance is Medicaid uh, and not Medicare Medicaid. Um, attributions to individual nephrologists are based on uh, MCP or monthly capitation payment billing, uh, which you may be more familiar with as uh, one of the up to four visits uh, that are uh, undertaken uh, for a patient on in-center hemodialysis or a monthly visit for a patient on uh, a home dialysis modality. Again, as I mentioned, uh, these attributed patients are aggregated at the TIN level within uh, a hospital referral region. So uh, in some hospital referral regions, it may actually include uh, more than one practice. Um, and these, uh, these patients are added and subtracted uh, on a monthly basis, uh, so that if a patient uh, develops a disease category uh, that excludes them from the model, then they're uh, removed. And if there are new incident patients that qualify, uh, they are attributed again on a month to month basis. And the bonus and penalties imposed on nephrologists are imposed on the nephrologists uh, collections from uh, MCP billing. Uh, as regards to the dialysis providers, similarly, um, only traditional Medicare ESRD and Medicare as a secondary payer are included. So MA and Medicaid primary are uh, excluded. Um, patients are attributed to a dialysis provider based on what's so-called 72X billing. Uh, this is a billing code for uh, by, billed by the dialysis provider for services rendered in the dialysis facility, the patients are aggregated by dialysis provider within the hospital referral region. So different dialysis providers will be held to their own uh, benchmarks uh, and it won't be aggregated across the entire HRR. Uh, again, monthly patient attribution, just like with the nephrologist and the bonus and penalties uh, imposed by ETC are on 72X billing specifically for the dialysis providers. So uh, ETC actually has two different types of payment adjustments. Uh, one is the home dialysis payment adjustment. Um, and this is an upside only payment adjustment applied to home dialysis claims only. So in 2021, uh, there will be a 3% increase in uh, payments to, uh, MC, to MCP payments for nephrologists and 72X billing for dialysis providers, 2% in 2022, 1% in 2023, and it's phased out thereafter. And then there is a so-called performance payment adjustment, uh, which has either an upside bonus or a downside penalty. And uh, these upside and downside payments uh, are applied to uh, all patients uh, with uh, end-stage renal disease based on uh, performance on a so-called modality performance score or MPS. Uh, transplant waitlisting, uh, which I will define further in subsequent slides, as well as living donor transplant rates um, are part of the modality performance store, uh, whereas deceased donor transplants are explicitly excluded. And we could perhaps get into why that is in the Q&A. So here it is in graphic form. The modality performance score is weighted more toward the home dialysis rate uh, compared to the transplant rate. Um, because the focus of this is really for transplant centers, the transplant rate for the purpose of the score is defined as the wait list rate plus the living donor transplant rate. Um, and the wait list rate is the number of beneficiary years uh, of patients listed for transplant divided by the total uh, MCP attributed beneficiary years. Um, Earlier listing uh, is incentivized so that if you have patients uh, who are listed for transplant early on in the uh, ETC model, then uh, the, both the dialysis provider and the nephrology practice will accrue more months uh, listed for transplant. And wait listing uh, can be either active or uh, inactive or status seven wait listing, that's important. And then the living donor transplant rate is the number of uh, living donor transplant beneficiary years, both preemptive patients who uh, qualify. So again, the attribution is the same for preemptively uh, transplanted re uh, recipients with a living donor, um, as well as ESRD patients receive a living donor divided by the total number of attributed uh, beneficiary years uh, plus preemptive living donor kidney transplants in the denominator. Clear as mud. So there are some exclusions uh, from the transplant rate. Uh, so patients who are under 18 or over age 75, uh, if their residence is outside of the United States, 
if they are not enrolled in Medicare Part B, if they are, again, not attributed because their primary payer is Medicare Advantage or Medicaid, um, if they uh, reside or receive dialysis in a subacute nursing facility or in a nursing home, um, if they have AKI not declared as ESRD on the 2728 form, if they have dementia, if they're enrolled in hospice. Uh, that being said, the ETC bonuses and penalties actually apply to all Part B claims for all attributed patients uh, with end-stage kidney disease, including, pay including payments uh, for the care of patients who meet the exclusion criteria. So uh, the way the ETC uh, benchmarking measurement and uh, payment intervals work uh, is in this staggered form outlined in this slide. So if you just come across the top here, uh, we have already uh, gone through the benchmark for measurement year one for the uh, modality performance score. Starting, in, starting January 1st of this year, uh, we are now, uh, those of us who are enrolled in the ETC uh, model are in the measurement year um, measuring against the benchmark that was set uh, 18 months ago. And uh, based on the, how, how the performance goes in the measurement year, uh, the payment or uh, the uh, penalty uh, for how one does in the measurement year uh, is either paid out or extracted in July of 2022. And as you can see, this frame shifts uh, every six months. So the idea here is that uh, the benchmarks for performance will shift uh, on a six month basis, uh, depending on uh, where all of the ETC participating practices fall uh, on a bell curve of performance as it were. So uh, the modality performance score uh, rank orders uh, in two ways. One is uh, how well the HRR does uh, as a, per, you know, what percentile uh, performance the HRR uh, achieves uh, in a given measurement year, or uh, the extent to which a, an HRR improves uh, over a prior measurement year. So at the 50th percentile uh, performance for either home modality prevalence uh, or transplant rate or both, you get one point. Um, but if you actually exhibit a five or a 10% improvement, uh, you can score points even if you're not at the uh, absolute percentile. Um, and performance payment adjustments are then uh, either realized as a bonus or uh, extracted as a penalty based on the, uh, the, the cumulative points you get from both uh, the home dialysis prevalence uh, and the transplant rate. Uh, and I'm going to show this in, in I think, uh, a little bit clearer form in the next few slides. So uh, what I have here is uh, what CMS has published as the uh, percentile uh, prevalence targets for uh, both the home dialysis rate uh, and the transplant rate for both uh, managing clinicians, again, who are attributed by MCP billing, and for ESRD facilities, again, who are... Uh, um, <clears throat> Who, who have patients attributed based on the 72X billings. So I would pay attention in particular to the 50th percentile there, uh, such that uh, the 50th percentile for measurement year one, which we're in now, uh, is a home dialysis prevalent rate of 12.75% and a transplant rate of 18.34%, uh, very close for managing clinicians as well. Um, so uh, achieving, uh, greater than 18.77% for the uh, transplant rate uh, will get you one point. Uh, or if uh, we were uh, further down in the payment model and you had the opportunity to demonstrate uh, a degree of improvement, you could also score along those lines. So uh, here are just some examples uh, of this. So if a nephrology practice uh, in an ETC performs at the 50th percentile in home therapies and the 50th percentile in the transplant rate, then their modality performance score is three because the home, <coughs> the, uh, the home performance is uh, weighted uh, double the transplant performance. And this would result uh, in a 0% adjustment uh, to the MCP and the 72X billings um, in, that, in that particular PPA, which would be in July of uh, 2022. Uh, in the second example, uh, nephrology practice in ETC performs at the 50 percentile in home therapies and the 75th percentile in the transplant rate. 
um, then they again would be, they would get 3.5 points and still would have a 0% adjustment uh, for the MCP and the 72X billings. Uh, for a nephrology practice and a dialysis facility that performs at the 35th percentile in home therapies and the 25th percentile in the transplant rate, um, they would get uh, a total of uh, one point. Uh, and, and so that would result in a, a negative 2.5% adjustment for both the MCP billings and the 72X billings for that six month interval. Uh, here's a few more. Um, if, uh, if the nephrology practice is at the 75th percentile in home therapies and exhibits a 10% uh, greater than 10% increase in the transplant rate uh, over from uh, measurement year to measurement year, then uh, they get a, a 2% bonus in their MCP uh, and the 72X billings. And then likely, uh, likewise, a nephrology practice uh, and a dialysis provider in an ETC doing very well on both um, still is getting a 2% adjustment. Um, so all of which to say, it's very, very difficult to uh, top this out, even with very high performances. Um, this is another way of looking at it. Uh, this is specifically looking at the, uh, the uh, bonuses and penalties for the nephrologist uh, MCP billings. So the, uh, the, the hashed uh, bars here show the 3%, 2%, and 1% bonus uh, that's part of the HDPDA that gets phased out in 2023 for home dialysis billings. Um, and then starting in the uh, second, uh, second half of 2022, you can realize uh, as much as a 4 or as, uh, as much as a 5% penalty. And as you can see, as the model goes further out in time, the bonuses and penalties uh, get much larger in both directions, but they are weighted toward penalties. Uh, similarly, uh, for dialysis clinics, uh, here's how the bonuses and penalties work. Again, uh, in the early phase, uh, there's a 3%, 2%, 1% bonus for home dialysis billings. Uh, and then the uh, bonuses and penalties for uh, dialysis clinic, dialysis providers um, also get larger over time. Uh, and uh, to just compare, uh, since these are absolute numbers, I just want to point out that the penalties, uh, the potential bonuses and penalties for dialysis clinics are much greater uh, than they are for nephrology practices. So what on earth does all of this mean for transplant centers? So what I want to try and do now is integrate uh, these ETC metrics into other metrics and trends uh, that affect uh, transplant programs. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, uh, a metric that is applied to uh, dialysis units uh, called the PPPW, or the Percent of Prevalent Patients Waitlisted. Um, some of you may be familiar with the, um, the QIP, uh, which is a bundle of quality metrics applied to dialysis facilities and include things like uh, urea clearance, uh, anemia, uh, and a variety of other um, uh, uh, metrics uh, that uh, affect the reimbursement uh, for dialysis claims. Uh, the PPPW is a relatively recent uh, metric uh, that is also going to be uh, included in the QIP. One of the differences between the PPPW metric uh, applied to the QIP for dialysis clinics and the ETC is that the uh, attribution of patients in ETC are broader uh, than they are for PPPW, which just includes traditional Medicare. Recall that ETC includes both patients with traditional Medicare as their uh, coverage, as well as patients whose Medicare, whose uh, secondary payer is Medicare. Uh, there, are also, there are also some parallel transplant center focused metrics that are worth considering as we think through the implications of the ETC model. So for example, uh, the so-called transplant rate that is uh, reported uh, through SRTR uh, is defined for the transplant center as the number of transplanted, the number of transplants performed divided by the number of waitlisted patient years, uh, and that could be active or inactive patients. And so uh, a, a transplant center that has a lot of patients listed for transplant uh, will tend to have a lower quote unquote transplant rate uh, than centers that have fewer patients waitlisted for transplant, whether they are active or status seven. Um, the rate of the, and of course, uh, as, as we are all familiar, uh, the rate of death on the waiting list and or wait list removal not for transplant is also a metric uh, that is publicly reported about transplant centers as well. 
Um, and that's a metric that may be affected by uh, one of the incentives in the uh, ATC model, which uh, we will talk about in further detail. Namely, uh, a significant increase in the number of referrals, new referrals uh, to centers for evaluation for listing. And then uh, an additional uh, concern or consideration for transplant centers is how uh, private commercial payers uh, negotiate global case rates um, for transplant. Uh, in particular, uh, center of excellence designation criteria sometimes uh, are tied to a transplant center's transplant rate, which uh, may be disfavorably uh, affected by a large increase in the waiting list. Um, and again, there are some uh, private payers that uh, may not be as inclined to negotiate favorable global case rates if there's a large number of patients who are waitlisted and ultimately removed for reasons other than transplant. So uh, what can transplant centers expect? Um, and what should transplant centers be concerned about with regard to the ETC model? Um, I think the first and most conspicuous is that transplant centers can expect a substantial increase uh, in new patient referrals because the ETC model explicitly encourages uh, increasing waitlisting, including inactive waitlisting. Uh, there's no particular requirement for nephrologists or dialysis providers as to which transplant center is listing patients. Um, that is, the uh, center where a patient is listed does not have to be within the same HRR as the nephrology provider and the dialysis provider. Uh, the uh, 50th percentile performance for, uh, re for transplant, as well as for home dialysis modalities, but for the purposes of this conversation for transplant, uh, will be rebased over time. So uh, hypothetically, if there's going to be more referrals uh, in all markets, uh, it is quite likely that achieving the 50th percentile uh, will require clearing a higher numerical hurdle uh, than, they, than it does right now. That the, the, uh, the mean uh, percentage to achieve just the 50th percentile uh, we can expect will go up. Um, there's limited uh, OPT and UNIS requirements for inactive waitlisting. Uh, in essence, uh, all it really requires is demographic information, uh, two ABO uh, uh, tests, uh, a PRA, uh, and the transplant center paying $748 to UNIS for registration. Uh, so by virtue of a fairly low bar uh, require, of requirements for inactive waitlisting, um, I think we can expect that inactive waitlisting uh, may increase. I think this will pose important operational challenges for transplant centers, uh, particularly since uh, I think most kidney transplant programs uh, are suffer the vicissitudes of uh, workforce challenges, uh, and challenges with throughput and patient tracking, even among the existing volume of referrals that they receive now. And there is a quality metric challenge for transplant centers since the uh, transplant center's transplant rate inversely uh, varies with the size of the waiting list. So precisely what's being incented by ETC, which is expanding the waiting list, uh, will uh, result in a lower transplant rate, which may be viewed unfavorably by uh, private payers. And a higher wait list in active population is likely to result in more patients ultimately removed from the wait list for reasons other than transplant. And all of this may result in uh, challenges in negotiating global case rates with private payers, uh, as well as the, uh, the challenge of uh, negotiating the, uh, the public facing data in terms of a center's reputation. So um, with new challenges, I think bring uh, new opportunities for collaboration. Uh, one, I think for transplant centers, uh, whether they're in, in an ETC HRR or not, uh, it's probably worthwhile getting to know, if you haven't, um, you're referring nephrologists and dialysis providers. I think there's definitely opportunity in, in the ETC model to develop new, new partnerships for structured outreach, outreach including things like unit-based uh, transplant education events. Um, <clears throat> our patients uh, disproportionately um, are on the wrong end of the social determinants of health. Uh, they quite often struggle with things like transportation. And so bringing uh, structured education uh, and in, indeed even initiating referrals from the dialysis clinic uh, as an offshoot of that uh, education, I think would be worthwhile. And I think would begin to strengthen the bonds between general nephrologist dialysis providers and transplant centers. 
I think this is, it's a useful stimulus for initiating a dialogue about who isn't a good candidate for a transplant referral, since uh, that's going to be the operative question for dialysis providers and nephrologists who are trying to figure out who they should and shouldn't refer. Uh, and I think it will involve revisiting critically uh, relative versus absolute contraindications to transplant and how in some iterative fashion uh, we can all partner to revisit uh, cohorts of patients who have relative and ideally remediable uh, contraindications to transplant to make sure that they also uh, get access to the waiting list and ideally to transplants themselves. Uh, I think ETC offers novel opportunities for collaboration for improving uh, inefficiencies in the evaluation process through things like uh, uh, modalities we're already uh, in the process of uh, pursuing by virtue of the pandemic. Virtual evaluation visits, uh, perhaps partnering with uh, dialysis providers and nephrology partners to order typical screening tests uh, so that the patient doesn't have to wait to go to the transplant center to obtain some of these. Um, identifying central points of contact for the unit's social worker and transplant coordinator uh, to improve uh, collaboration and communication. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for uh, transplant center uh, leaders uh, to partner with nephrology medical directors of dialysis facilities uh, to create uh, transplant referral uh, QAPI projects uh, which I think will have the benefit of improving communication and also identifying barriers that perhaps none of the stakeholders are aware of. Um, I do think that as dialysis providers and nephrology practices start to gear up to refer quite a number of patients to the center, it's probably worth the time on the center's part to revisit your written candidate selection criteria Ask the, ask the question of whether your center actually follows your written selection and transplant criteria, uh, whether it's too cumbersome and too complex, and importantly, whether your written criteria may inadvertently be ruling out too many candidates up front. Um, I would suggest, uh, and I've perhaps overdetermined it by naming it this, but that this new collaboration opportunity uh, may, may offer us the chance to uh, consider a strategy which I call smart waitlisting. Um, and by smart waitlisting, I mean a process that both increases the visibility of candidates by virtue of increasing the inactive list, um, takes into account changes in the kidney allocation system, takes into account the workforce limitations of transplant centers, and also uh, while also realizing uh, a variety of evaluation workflow inefficiencies. So what do I mean? Um, in general, uh, with the change in the kidney allocation system, um, waiting time is going to take on uh, additional importance in who gets an organ. And so uh, if it's reasonable to suspect that a transplant center is going to be inundated with referrals, it does make sense to prioritize uh, the actual evaluation of patients who are likely to get an organ offer by virtue of the waiting time they bring to the transplant center at the time of referral, likely to get an organ offer within 12 to 18 months. So while this doesn't ex exclusively prioritize ESRD vintage, i.e. how many years of time on dialysis, uh, it could also include patients who are extremely sensitized uh, or who are interested in consenting for so-called high risk or special categories of organ. Uh, but the general idea is that if uh, we can't in the short term fix the workforce limitations of, through, of evaluation throughput in transplant centers, we can at least prioritize patients who are likely going to get uh, an organ often early on, get their uh, multidisciplinary evaluation uh, complete and current uh, to avoid uh, uh, iterative, repetitive uh, testing uh, sometimes over many years. Now that's going to leave a lot of people um, out of the first priority. Uh, and so what happens to the rest? Well, uh, if, if we postulate that inactive listing doesn't have to simply be a place where patients sit for months, if not years uh, without, with inaction, this may be an opportunity to foreground uh, the, the need that those patients have too, even if they don't have a high priority uh, in the new uh, kidney allocation system. Uh, for these patients, uh, I propose targeted education for on, on uh, the advantages of living donation, 
uh, connecting these patients to, uh, for example, a donor champion model uh, with in-person dialysis facility outreach, uh, such that uh, by, by, by providing these kinds of resources to the patient population who may be facing many years before they get an organ offer, there's still an opportunity for these patients to realize uh, the benefits of transplant by really foregrounding both their need and the importance of identifying a living donor. So uh, two, there may be opportunities for a common cause uh, between various stakeholders uh, here, including specifically nephrology practices, dialysis providers, and transplant centers. Uh, one potential opportunity is a collaborative effort to revisit metrics um, and the criteria whereby global case rates are negotiated. So uh, in the ETC model, it seems clear to me that the transplant center transplant rate and the waitlist removal rate are going to be misleading if the size of a transplant waiting list uh, increases substantially. That the, uh, the, the cost of increasing uh, the waiting list, whether it's increasing in, in the active or inactive population or both, uh, is that everybody's transplant, everybody who does this, their transplant rate and their waitlist removal rate uh, are going to go in the quote unquote wrong direction. So uh, instead, it may be useful to, instead of uh, having the denominator as the total number of waitlisted years, change the denominator for the transplant rate to waitlist active years as a denominator. Again, imperfect, but perhaps uh, an improvement. Um, it's also possible that we need to identify new metrics that really capture uh, what we're trying to uh, accomplish. Uh, and to that end, uh, I would commend uh, a recent article by uh, Paul and colleagues, Early View, in the American Journal of Transplantation that uh, think through uh, this particular challenge in, in a particularly thoughtful way. Um, I think that uh, collectively, we should consider uh, approaching private payers who make use of these metrics to uh, negotiate their global case rates and suggest that there may be an alternative methodology that doesn't result in un unintended and undesirable consequences, and really uh, collectively develop new metrics that will benefit patients and help stakeholders as a whole. Um, I, I did have the opportunity uh, recently to have a conversation with the executive leadership of uh, UNOS OPTN to talk about uh, the potential downstream implications for a large increase in the waitlist inactive candidate population. Uh, currently, the $748 fee that transplant centers pay to UNOS for uh, candidate registration is passed through on the transplant center's Medicare cost report. Uh, though typically this is collected in arrears, uh, it does seem to me that, especially if the waitlist and active population increases substantially, uh, that UNOS may want to may want to consider either tiered fees for patients who were registered as waitlist inactive, uh, or abandon those fees altogether and uh, lump it into fees that are paid once a patient actually becomes waitlist active. Um, I would add that uh, you know these these are matters that are bigger than the ETC uh, mandatory payment model, because uh, what ETC does is highlights and foregrounds the question of how these stakeholders uh, develop and cultivate uh, robust connections and opportunities for collaboration. Um, I think that ETC is, uh, is certainly upon us, uh, but offers us the opportunity to actually try and increase access to transplant. Uh, without compromising quality. Um, there's clear overlaps between the ETC mandatory model and some incentives in the voluntary payment models. Um, th those specific overlaps uh, are really beyond the uh, scope of this talk, uh, but they are definitely there. Uh, I think that ETC is a, uh, a harbinger of future value-based care arrangements uh, that may be possible across the entire continuum of care from advanced CKD to ESRD to transplant and then from transplant CKD back to some sort of renal replacement therapy again. I think this is sort of the first step in uh, what may evolve into population health-based uh, payment models across the entire continuum of kidney disease. Uh, I think that uh, importantly, uh, ETC indirectly uh, emphasizes uh, the need to develop processes for safe tra safer transitions of care from patients with advanced CKD and a transplant to renal replacement therapies. 
Um, the literature suggests that uh, these patients end up starting uh, with uh, a tunnel catheter at fairly high rates, you know, around 70%, with a very high mortality um, and very high costs. I think there's plenty of opportunity to do better um, and improve uh, patient quality of life and survival. Uh, and I think that developing and ingraining these uh, communication pathways across the stakeholders is the way to accomplish that. And then I think ETC also raises the question, uh, which goes back to uh, the workforce limitations of our transplant centers is, you know, who really is and who really should have the responsibility for caring for the more than 100,000 patients in the United States with a functioning transplant over the long term? Um, and, and these are questions uh, that I address in, in some of the work that I've done over the last few years in AJT. Um, but I think are related to the challenges uh, that, that the ETC model poses for all of us. Uh, and with that, uh, I will pause uh, and take your comments and questions. And thank you. And that was spectacular. And, and certainly I think prompted a lot of interest on behalf of our attendees uh, as noted by the, the numbers of questions. Again, I'll encourage folks that have questions, please submit them to the Q&A uh, bar there at the bottom of your screen. And um, I can, uh, let me just start with one, and, and then um, there I'm sure we'll have many to follow. And this is really set up by all of us, you know, that this began with you know, the previous administration, the executive and the executive order is no longer in office. So it, you know, one of the questions that was brought up is, is it possible that this and and other uh, objectives of the AAKH, you might go away with this change in administration. It may be a, certainly a question, I'm sure you don't have firsthand knowledge, but I'm just curious of your thoughts with the, you know, really the, the, the wave of, uh, of interest that this has already brought about. Uh, it's a great question, Matt, and I have no unique insight into this. Uh, my hunch, <clears throat> and I want to underscore it's that it's just a hunch, is that uh, the incoming administration has so many uh, substantial challenges um, to uh, address, uh, not the least of which being the global pandemic. Uh, and that uh, since this, these particular payment models are complete and promulgated uh, and really uh, the, their, the seeds of them uh, were in the previous administration, uh, my sense is that uh, unless they, unless uh, folks at HHS find something really terribly broken with them as they're implemented, uh, they are unlikely to revisit them. Uh, but I, that, that really is just my best guess. Ben, again, excellent, uh, excellent presentation on a very clear subject that we all understand. So, um, congratulations. One of the first uh, uh, questions was. When do you think uh, this may become widely applied to all practices, if any? Uh, again, uh, stipulating I don't have a crystal ball, uh, the experience with the ESCOs suggests that uh, CMMI's preferred uh, mode of operation is to uh, pilot these kinds of payment models uh, for a couple of years and see how they work. Uh, and, and so I think until we have several years of data, uh, I think it is unlikely that these payment models will be expanded uh, at, least, at least under the rubric of the ETC. Now that being said, uh, and to your point, Uh there is quite a lot of change uh, transpiring uh, on the uh, reimbursement landscape in ESRD, not the least of which uh, is the 21st uh, Century Cures Act, uh, which became operational in January. Uh, which uh, will allow for the first time uh, patients with ESRD and traditional Medicare to purchase Medicare Advantage plans. Now, how many of those uh, patients will actually do so is difficult to say, but uh, one of the perhaps unintended downstream effect uh, consequences of that is how it will affect patient attribution for both the mandatory model uh, as well as the voluntary payment models. Um, it's anyone's guess as to uh, demographically whether future Medicare Advantage patients look different, quote unquote, uh, than patients who remain in traditional Medicare. Uh, again, my own 
best guess is that patients who elect for Medicare Advantage plans will in general uh, tend to be uh, um, healthier, um, perhaps have a higher rate of health literacy and uh, may have a higher access to transplant. Again, that's just a guess. Um, but what that, if that's true, what it means is that the, patient remain, the patients remaining in the traditional Medicare population will disproportionately be uh, on the wrong end of the social determinants of health and, and may be, as a group, more challenged, uh, uh, stipulating they're already quite challenged, uh, to uh, get access to transplantation. So I think that uh, by virtue of this change in MA, however prevalent it becomes, uh, the, the urgency of developing solutions for patients who remain in traditional Medicare uh, are going to uh, remain urgent. Ben, do you have, do you have any insight into um, why Medicaid patients were excluded from these metrics? Certainly the, the, appreci the appreciation is that you know, Medicaid patients may potentially be disadvantaged in getting them to transplant programs and ultimately transplanted if the incentive to, for all right. that to happen does not allow them to be included in any of these metrics. Yeah, uh, I see that's Dr. Patcher's question and, and it's a very good one. Uh, I think the reason that Medicaid patients were excluded is simply because uh, Medicaid is administered uh, on the state level. Now that being said, uh, I, I don't see that uh, dialysis providers uh, and nephrologists are going to be constructing uh, bespoke solutions to access to transplant solely for patients who are attributed in the ETC model. Uh, I think that's just, it's, uh, it's, it's too much work and it's just not really the right thing to do. The right thing to do uh, is to develop a comprehensive uh, program whereby the referral to evaluation to waitlisting process is streamlined for all patients, regardless of payer. There, um, one of the one of the questions I was raised, um, which is an interesting question, is uh, how much, if if we could say, collaboration was there between the transplant community and the. ETC uh, uh, preparation or uh, uh, making of the ETC? What do you think, uh, Ben? Uh, I think that there was conversation uh, with uh, leaders of the transplant community uh, in the course of designing this model. Um, the extent to which that feedback was incorporated into the model uh, is something I have no insight into. Uh, I think if, uh, if the response of the community that I have identified as any measure, uh, it uh, did not make anyone especially happy uh, with, with the end product. Uh, that being said, um, I do think that uh, there are opportunities here uh, within the model to make substantive improvements. So while it's not what I would have designed, um, I think that it's absolutely something we can work with. And, and my own view, Ruben, is that if it is a spur to develop uh, innovative ways of getting people access to transplant successfully, then it's successful. Ben, you, uh, this is a question that uh, was posed by one of our attendees and certainly one that I've had as well. You know, one of the original points of this ETC model was to include deceased donor transplants. Do you know, do you know why that was, or you have uh, an opinion as to why that was pulled out of, you know, what is, you know, currently in the model? So, yes, um, I, I believe the reason that deceased donor kidney transplantation was removed from the model was because of the change in the kidney allocation system, uh, moving to a, a more geographic model. I think the thought was that uh, the designers of this model really wanted to identify levers that they thought that a nephrology, a nephrologist and a dialysis provider could affect. Um, they thought they could affect at least referral rates uh, they thought that 
uh, focusing on waitlisting rather than referral uh, might go some distance to uh, the default uh, behavioral uh, route of referring just everybody. Uh, and that uh, there may be some opportunities for nephrologists and dialysis providers to encourage living donor kidney transplantation. But by virtue of uh, a more geographic or a less DSA dependent, I should say, uh, allocation system, uh, it was thought that uh, tying performance to deceased donor kidney transplants didn't make as much sense uh, with the decreasing importance of DSAs. And Ben, uh, I think added to that, uh, several of the questions uh, are related to the potential impact uh, to their uh, transplant program. So uh, programs that have uh, uh, a high transplant rate uh, or maybe smaller wait list versus the opposite. Um, uh, you know, there, I think there's concern about the potential impact of the future. So uh, what's your thought about this? Um, so operationally, I think that transplant centers generally uh, can and should expect uh, a large increase in referrals. Uh, and I think that that will create a, a throughput problem for many transplant programs. Um, I offered what I think is uh, a step toward a solution with smart waitlisting, um, taking this group of referrals, prioritizing them uh, based on their likelihood of getting an organ offer after listing uh, in terms of you know, time priority, um, and really focusing on the rest, uh, living donor education, uh, possibly in certain circumstances, in, uh, education in uh, consenting patients for quote unquote, higher risk organs. Um, I, I do think that uh, it's going to involve, and I think it will uh, spur uh, more collaboration with uh, nephrology practices and dialysis providers uh, to get a clearer uh, view of the entire population of potentially referable patients um, and think through how the efficiency of the process from referral to waitlisting can be realized. That may happen by asking nephrologists to, or dialysis providers or both, uh, to take on uh, more aspects of the referral process, um, develop better lines of communication, things that uh, may realize uh, efficiencies in the process that in, in many places just don't, don't exist. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with the phenomenon Certainly I am as, I, I'm both a transplant nephrologist and a general nephrologist, uh, referring a patient for transplant and then not knowing what happened to them for months or sometimes years uh, until I find out sort of what, what the end product was. I think this black box between referral and, and wait listing uh, is something that uh, needs to be systematically dismantled. Again, I, I just, the number of your slides where you've offered not only suggestions about how this can work best in terms of collaboration, which I know has been a passion of yours. I, I, I love some of your ideas about how to make it better. Do you, do you know, is there, um, or what would you suspect is the potential of, of looking at ways of improving this model? For instance, from looking at the denominator to include both active and inactive to only include active patients. Cause it, it does sort of you know, fly in the face of reason to say we want to encourage dialysis centers to send patients to transplant programs to only have them being listed inactive. There, there really isn't obviously a benefit to the patient to do that. There's a, you know, a challenge for the transplant program to do all the things, like you said, that are necessary to clear someone, put them on the list. So is there, yeah. is there an expectation that there's going to be a review of this and maybe a tightening up of, you know, the, the, the model to make it more, you know, I think value add. I think there will be an impetus to review it if there is a collective will um, among transplant professional societies, dialysis providers, and nephrology professional societies to look at that. Um, I think absent that, there, there won't be a review of that. But I would also just say, and, and Matt, this actually uh, uh, foreshadows a, a debate that you and I will be moderating at ATC this year which I would thumbnail as, what is it that we mean when we talk about access to transplantation? That, what access to transplantation means could be a great many things. It could be an ac access to actual numbers of transplants, which I think we would all agree is 
you know, encompasses access to transplantation. Um, access to the waiting list is, in my view, not the same as access to transplantation. It's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient trans, uh, condition to get a transplant. Um, and then, you know, referrals behind that uh, is an even stickier wicket. So I think what we really need to do is have some hard conversations uh, about what access to transplantation really means um, and, and try and find a way to come up with a definition that doesn't leave out uh, people who either never get referred when they should uh, or what are, what are even more worrying to me, people who get referred and then just you know, end up in this ether uh, that never gets resolved. Uh, so yes, I think that uh, if we collectively come together, uh, these different stakeholders who uh, have often had difficulty sitting down at a table with one another and, and making common cause, then yes, I think that uh, I think that that would be compelling, but just by virtue of being unique uh, to CMMI to revisit some of these metrics. You know, we're coming, we're coming to the end of the hour, but uh, several of the questions were uh, related to, yes, the, the presentation will be available. Um, there was a question about will the, uh, will, where's the map that shows the participating practices in ETC, and that's available at CMS website. Uh, in fact, you can Google ETC and, and it'll show you the map. But the map shows you only the selected geographic areas. You have to, you have to go down to the zip codes and, and, and it will tell you uh, the nephrologist or practices that will be part of it, but that, that is available. And I'd also just add, um, I my email is uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, th these are these are complicated models with lots of moving parts. Uh, and I, if if I can be of service in, in helping to answer these questions or clarify any any of these individually for you as a transplant program, uh, or connect you with people who can, I am more than happy to do that. Okay, on behalf of the uh, AST KP Community Practice, I want to sincerely thank uh, Ben Hippen, uh, and he is sincere. He he will take the time to answer your questions. I'll, I'll pass on his cell phone to everybody as well. Feel free to call him in the middle of the night. He, <laughs> he, he, loves, he loves those phone calls. But again, this is incredibly enlightening. I, I think we leave here, you know, with the, uh, with the appreciation that this is a significant opportunity. And if we look at it as an opportunity and we continue to work on the collaboration, which again, Ben has been, you know, a, a true stalwart supporter of, you know, there is potentially a, a way to provide more transplant opportunities for uh, patients who obviously will significantly benefit from that. So the presentation will be on the website and um, I think Olivia may have a, a few uh, parting words, but again, my thanks for the participant, uh, for those who participated and my sincere thanks to Ben Hippen for taking the time out to present this very complicated topic. Thank you. Um, and on behalf of AST, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Hippen for your wonderful presentation and Dr. Cooper and Dr. Velez for moderating our session today, today as well as all of our attendees. Um, please remember to complete the evaluation survey and we will follow up offline to answer questions we did not have time for. We will also be posting the recording to both the KPCOP hub and the AST YouTube channel. Um, thank you again. And if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to email me. Uh, my email is osnow at myast.org. Uh, thank you again.